I'm the bureau chief for Bloomberg News. Um, I'm here pro bono. It's important uh, that you know that. What is important so also is that I wouldn't have been able to moderate this panel if we had only one woman on the panel. It, Bloomberg actually states that there's a need to be diversity in each and every conference or else we cannot attend. It's important that I say that, so um, I'm saying it. So when I prepared for this panel, it, it was like very interesting for me to find out. We're talking about urgency, but actually all the questions I came up with, I had the same three years ago or even five years ago. Some that I had already written for another conference. And I'm afraid, and I was afraid, that to realize that these questions actually remain pretty much the same um, and abate with an increased sense of urgency. Where will we be in three or five years' time asking ourselves the same questions? Where will the urgency be? Will it be too late? I just wonder, we will have moved on to the point that actually it's not that urgent anymore. It's very difficult to feel that way. Um, California is burning, Australia is burning right now. Uh, the Amazon forest is still burning, the oceans keep getting warmer and more acidic. Fish are disappearing and it's plastic is spreading. Um, it's been a very hot summer in Europe, as uh, some of you Parisians have noticed. And we are here and we're just discussing. But in any case, I'm fortunate to be joined here with um, Judith Hartmann. She's the CFO of NG and um, she has very interesting anecdotes. Um, Judith, uh, beyond her uh, responsibility, is also a mountain climber. So she's been climbing mountains for more than 20 years, top ones, high ones, and she has been able to witness by herself what's going on um, regarding climate warming. There's Pierre Elbron, who's the uh, vice president for the EBRD. There's uh, Kerry Adler, chairman and CEO of Sky Power. And last but not least, uh, Gérard Mestralet, who is the co-president of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition. So here's to kickstart to kick this discussion. Here's my first question to all of you. What is for you the uh, state of emergency? What do you focus on? What do you see? Judith. Uh, thank you for this introduction, and I think the way you put it in terms of, you know, what is the sense of emergency and are we moving fast enough is a very relevant question. What I would say to this is, it is, uh, there is a big emergency, you know, we know, we all know the statistics today already, uh, you mentioned the temperatures that are swinging, you mentioned the wildfires, there's 25 million people a year that are displaced already, and that's the one we know of because of climate change. And it really is a business topic, you know, in, uh, during the summer there was 200 of the biggest companies that got together and estimated their cost of climate change of, over the next five years and they came up with a number of one trillion dollars. So it is a big topic for all of us, for, for, for business leaders, and it is something that we need to focus on very quickly and uh, continue to make progress. You mentioned, you know, would we have said the same thing three years ago? Certainly I can say about NG three years ago, uh, we, we were a different company. We have now uh, a very massive renewables footprint. We now have, we now install three to four gigawatts a year of wind and solar, which was uh, very limited at the time. And we have made great progress also around energy efficiency because, of course, there is how do I produce better energy and then there's also how do I use less energy, which is very important given, of course, the increase of the population and all our expectations on quality of life. And so those are, those are clearly two topics that, uh, that are very dear to, uh, to, to our heart. Kerry, you want to, what do you see? as the immediate focus, where is the emergency for you? I, I think the emergency is the lack of understanding that we've be, all become victim to the universal law of procrastination. And where we sit today, it's not climate change, it's climate changed. And until we appreciate that the climate has changed, we're not gonna make any headway. I personally, and I'm, I, I'm not a pessimist, people who know me, I just, and I don't climb mountains, so I don't see from your perspective, but I travel the world last year over 40 countries. You could put out a forest fire with water, but you can't make ice grow. 
So I think we have to acknowledge that we are beyond the point that we're going to hit any of the targets. And we have to start looking at this as we're on a runway and we're on the jet. We're going to have to find ways to lengthen that runway until technologies can adapt, until businesses around the world can adapt. What NG is doing, and like we're along, doing along with NG and other companies around the world, is putting solar projects, you're doing some wind, and that's demonstrating that we can do this. But you know, if you walk into a restaurant in Paris, I can't remember the, the last time I got a straw. In fact, I think the last straw that I got was probably in Monaco a year and a half ago. So to me, that's the last straw. If we can do it with a straw, why can we not do it with emissions? Think about it. Straws are fundamental to every restaurant, every bar. So if these small businesses are setting examples by eradicating straws, plastics, why don't we use that as a lesson, as a platform? Is it carbon tax? Is it just illegal, subject to penalties? Should CEOs of companies who don't take legally required steps to reduce their emissions face harsh punishment, maybe be ostracized by the public community? The emergency is, again, procrastination. Until it is too late, no one will know what it is to do. And by the time they know what it is to do, it will be too late, there won't be sufficient time. I will add a little bit to what has, uh, has been said by starting by a positive note, which is we are in a country which likes demonstrations, uh, and we'll see that probably in the next days. Elie, the, the, the last month have been, uh, I think, marked by demonstrations about the emergency uh, around climate change and, and the need to fight. This has led to political implications, uh, as you know, European elections have been very much centered around that. Uh, the new president of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the European Commission put this Green Deal very much at the center of our ambitions. And we see as a practical institution and a key investor uh, the need of mobilizing investment on this agenda and scaling up uh, what has been done uh, as uh, clearly an emergency. We all know the figures, the statistics. Uh, OECD has, has clearly shown that uh, non-action non costs much more than, than uh, the $2.5 trillion uh, dollars which are needed to, to be carbon neutral uh, at uh, 2050. The question is now how we deliver this agenda and um, as an institution which is centered on, on private sector uh, development, private money uh, mobilization, but being also a public institution, a development institution, we see very much that there are, uh, this is an agenda which is uh, profitable, impactful uh, and scalable. Uh, since uh, it's not because EBRD has been uh, particularly gifted in, in, in that field, but we've started in, in countries which were very energy inefficient. Uh, so obviously we've developed a product which can be scaled up uh, very strongly and uh, uh, going beyond the 1,600 projects we've done uh, until now, we need really an alliance between private, public sectors, and I think where, what has been done in putting the right incentive, the right price signals, and what Gérard has uh, championed also over the last uh, years, putting together ministers of finance, ministers of environment, but more importantly, probably, uh, private sector around the table is really fundamental. Oui, pour moi, l'urgence euh, tient à un facteur euh, central, le fait que, les, malgré la conférence de Paris, cinq, quatre ans après la conférence de Paris, les émissions de CO2 dans le monde continuent d'augmenter, et d'augmenter vite, plus de 2% euh, l'année dernière. Or, on a, on a pris collectivement, euh, dans l'ensemble de, 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 de décisions, pour la première fois, 190 pays euh, se sont penchés sur, sur un sujet, 
Et ce sujet, c'était le climat, ça aurait pu être la fin dans le monde, la santé, euh, l'accès à l'eau, euh, euh, la violence. Non, c'était sur le climat. Eh bien, quatre ans après, on constate euh, qu'on n'y est pas. Vous avez peut-être noté la, euh, la publication par euh, euh, l'Agence internationale de l'énergie, hier, de son rapport annuel. Il est assez terrifiant, au fond. Qu'est-ce qu'il qu qu montre il montre que, euh, avec les politiques actuelles, la consommation d'énergie dans le monde va continuer d'augmenter de, de 1,3% jusqu'en 2040. Alors évidemment, la population mondiale augmente, euh, il y a de la croissance mondiale, euh, mais 1,3% d'augmentation de, de consommation d'énergie, euh, ça fait évidemment, euh, évidemment très peur. Euh, si on ajoute à ce trend actuel, toutes les mesures qui ont été annoncées, pas forcément décidées et encore moins mises en place aujourd'hui, euh, ça ne suffira encore pas. La, les émissions de, de CO2 et de gaz à effet de serre continueront d'augmenter euh, dans, le, dans le monde, alors évidemment à un rythme plus faible, mais continueront d'augmenter. Et donc on n'atteindra jamais les 2 degrés avec ces mesures, et encore moins euh, les 1,5 qui sont euh, l'objectif, euh, disons, souhaitable euh, aujourd'hui. Donc, pour, euh, 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 pour contrer cette évolution qui est assez, assez tragique, moi, je vois deux, 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 deux priorités. Euh, c'est le prix du carbone, mais je suis là pour ça. Euh, euh, c'est ma fonction, ma casquette actuelle. Et deuxièmement, l'efficacité énergétique. Euh, pourquoi l'efficacité énergétique Parce que euh, le rapport de l'Agence de l'énergie le montre clairement. La consommation d'énergie... Elle, elle, elle va augmenter forcément, la population mondiale augmente, les, les, euh, euh, la croissance mondiale augmente. Euh, et donc, si on n'arrive pas à, à réduire les consommations d'énergie par unité de, de produite, euh, on ne réduira jamais euh, les émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Aujourd'hui, l'efficacité énergétique a a été réduit de 1%, 1,3% enfin, l'année dernière dans le, dans le monde. Or, et donc, il faudrait au moins 3%. Euh, donc l'efficacité énergétique, à mon avis, doit devenir l'une des priorités des politiques énergétiques gouvernementales. Et euh, je félicite Engie pour l'engagement euh, le, d'Engie dans ce domaine de l'efficacité énergétique. Euh, et deuxièmement, le, le prix du carbone, aujourd'hui, parce qu'au fond... Il peut y avoir des politiques spécifiques sur le charbon, sur le, le pétrole, sur, pour réduire les, les, les consommations, essayer de fermer les centrales charbon. Mais tout ça va prendre euh, énormément de, de temps. Euh, je pense que le, le, ce qu'il faut, c'est que les émetteurs de CO2 payent pour ces émissions de CO2. Et euh, si le prix du carbone est suffisamment élevé... Euh, et qu'une tarification du carbone ou hein, une taxe carbone est appliquée euh, très largement dans le monde, alors il s'agira de, de, de raisons économiques qui pousseront tous les acteurs, quels qu'ils soient, les financiers, les industriels, les consommateurs, à s'orienter vers les solutions euh, basse, euh, basse énergie. Je disais qu'il y a beaucoup d'inertie et j'ai terminé par ça. Euh, il y a beaucoup d'inertie dans le système. L'énergie, c'est des investissements très longs, même, même euh, solaire un petit peu moins, euh, l'éolien pas mal. Évidemment, les, 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 le, euh, le système énergétique mondial tel qu'il existe euh, aujourd'hui a un moment d'inertie. Euh, mon exemple est en Allemagne. Euh, Savez-vous que l'année prochaine, en 2020, l'Allemagne va inaugurer une très grande centrale charbon, euh, toute neuve euh, euh, très moderne, enfin très moderne, elle a été conçue et lancée en 2005. Elle aurait dû normalement être mise en service en 2011. Mais il y a eu des retards techniques, euh, des, 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 des difficultés. Donc elle va ouvrir en 2020. Et c'est une centrale de 1100 MW, donc une, une très grosse centrale. Et on n'a pas pu l'arrêter. Voilà, donc le système a, a une inertie euh, considérable. Et à mon avis, c'est aussi probablement euh, ce dont on n'a pas suffisamment pris conscience. On a eu l'impression, après l'accord de Paris, ça y est, on s'était fixé des objectifs, donc on allait les, les atteindre. Mais entre euh, les discours et même les engagements qui sont pris, et ensuite les réalisations sur le terrain, il se passe beaucoup de temps. Et ça, c'en est, est un exemple. C'est terrifiant de savoir qu'on on ferme des centrales nucléaires qui n'émettent pas de CO2. Bon, 
peut avoir l'opinion qu'on veut sur le nucléaire, mais on ferme des centrales nucléaires en Allemagne qui n'émettent pas de CO2, et on va ouvrir des centrales euh, charbon qui vont d'ailleurs produire plus cher. La façon de faire fermer ces centrales, c'est d'avoir un prix du carbone suffisamment élevé, euh, au-delà de 30 euros, et on n'est pas loin, on est à 25 aujourd'hui en Europe, dans le système ETS. Au-delà de 30 euros, il devient anti-économique de produire de l'électricité à partir du, du, du charbon, et plus intéressant de le produire à partir de gaz. C ce sera, le, ce sera la, le premier switch. Après, bien entendu, euh, peut-être à, à plus long terme, il faudra, il faudra davantage de, de renouvelables. Mais il y a beaucoup de renouvelables. L'Allemagne a construit sept fois plus de renouvelables que la France. Et malgré tout ça, euh, le résultat, c'est que les émissions augmentent. Il faudra, we must, we should, uh, who's we uh, My question to you is that, should it be um, the government, the authorities um, That's what some citizens are, are, are thinking, actually. You, we had this global extension protest throughout the globe, um, directly addressing the authorities. Should it be us, the individuals? Should it be the companies? Now that they are also faced with um, the um, impalatable reality of uh, climate warming, should it be associations? How can we do that? I recently interviewed a young um, high school pupil um, as part of the ju a jury, and she was um, uh, actually saying that there should be a dictatorship. Climate warming has reached a point when there should be a dictatorship. So I thought I felt that was like pretty much interesting, especially um, she's French and we're in a democracy. So I'm just asking you, what should we do? Who's we? And should we expect the governments or the authorities actually to do something? <coughs> Kerry. I, I think we need to, you know, address the elephant in the room, and that is, you know, and I say this with all due respect. It's been over a decade, at least the years that I can count, that we have try to come up with some form of a carbon tax. But economic laws of parity don't work in this instance because you can have a tax for India because their GDP per capita is lower and then you have a higher tax for the wealthier, more fortunate nations. But there's not a single example in the world, and that's all we have is to look at history, where we've been able to implement a universal law because that's what it needs to be in order for a carbon tax to work. So with all these brilliant people in this room and many rooms I've sat in around the world going back 16 years since I've been in renewables, no one's been able to come to an agreement. Maybe it's time we stop looking at ways to penalize people with the stick and look at a carrot. If you look at the earth, it's a living organism, like a human body. If a human body were to get sick, it exhibits certain symptoms. The first is the sense that something's not right. Maybe a little bit of pain. The pain, to draw a comparison, would be the youth that's starting to speak up. That's the pain of our world, crying. Then you start seeing forest fires, melting glaciers, earthquakes, rare storms. That's the sickness. So imagine we're all Just imagine for a second, we're all sitting on the deck here in the Titanic. We know what happened to the Titanic. But the difference here is that iceberg isn't there anymore. But we don't know how bad it's going to be or how long the ship is going to last. But we're sitting here arranging chairs on the Titanic. So we have to do something profound. Simple things. One day every year, Every man, woman, and child, or child, woman, and man, is required to take a seedling and plant it. Do you know that if we planted one tree, and assume the child had to be over 10 or 12 years old, if we each planted a tree, one tree, one day a year, we could delay the impact of what scientists, 11,000 scientists who've just signed a declaration of a climate emergency, by at least five to seven years. A tree, a seedling is sense. Now, if you take that tree and you allow it to grow five or seven years, and Honduras has been doing this for over a decade, 
You can then take that tree, cut it down, use it as firewood, create shelter. You can create energy, build furniture, create jobs, capacity building. So instead of trying to find a way to do something that is going to tax or penalize, because let's face it, the only people who have the real power to do this is central bankers. The central bankers around the world, if they all sat together in a room, they seem to be able to agree on a lot of things. They're probably the most agreeable. If the central banker sat around the room and came up with a way that they would enforce through maybe interest rates or other mechanisms, then we have hope. But I don't have hope. Hope is not part of a strategy. We've been hoping for too long. We have to act. And we have to act with our conscience. Because the reality is, it's our grandchildren that are going to be living with the consequences of the decisions and the conversations that have been going on for 20 years. We have to make profound commitments and we have to follow through. It's not tax. It's empowering the youth to join with us and find that solution. Simple things. Trees. Trees is one step. It's not an economic reality to assume that companies with 40, 50 billion dollar market cap who are generating emissions are expected to stop tomorrow morning or reduce by 20 or 30 percent because the technology is not there to allow them to do so and they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. I get it. That is another part of the reality. You can't, if you're in India, just shut down the coal industry, even though we all know it's wrong and the price of solar is lower than the price of domestic coal, you can't shut it down, what are you going to do with those six million jobs? But put in place a transition system. Put in place transition to a cleaner form of energy. But if we don't make decisions in the next six to nine months that we act upon, the world as we know it today will not be the world we know it, and not in 10 years, in five years. But who's we? This is my question. Who should do this, you, me? At our individual level, should it be governments, authorities, should it be associations, should it be people led by a 16-year-old youth? Judith. I think we is all of us. I think we is, uh, is the four of us sitting here, it's all of you sitting in the room. I think it's uh, policy makers, it's individuals, it's obviously big companies. The challenge is massive, it's an uphill battle. We, you know, there obviously population growth is going to continue and some of the effects that, um, that are going to translate in the next few years are based on emissions that have already happened. So, I mean, we have, we have a, a, big, a big challenge in front of us, but I'm, I'm much more optimistic, I would say, uh, on this just because I think a lot of the solutions exist today, technological solutions. So, you know, you will remember only 10 years ago, we, all of us would have been sitting here thinking photovoltaic, yes, it's great, but it's way too expensive. It's never, never going to really take off. It's completely taken off. It's ubiquitous, okay? It's, on, it's everywhere and it's, uh, it's at the right price. Of course, wind is now mainstream. And then there's other topics that need to be worked. I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that it's not going to be one solution because uh, the, the, um, the complexity is too big. But once you compi combine the different solutions, it's also going to have to be greening of gas, more methanization, uh, green hydrogen. All of those things are available today. We've got to make sure that we go to scale and that we uh, do the same like we've just done for uh, solar, which is taking down the cost by 10% and, and be able to deploy it massively. So it's all our responsibility. As companies, of course, we're also here to create shareholder value, so we need to make sure that, it's, uh, that we can uh, still make benefits, uh, you know, financial benefits at the same time. It's our responsibility to re reduce costs and find the right solutions. Policymakers need to look at this. And again, I would encourage to look at a complete equation because one solution will not work. It's going to have to be a, a, a number of things. Carbon pricing, I do believe, is part of the story, obviously. And then all of us uh, as individuals, or else it's not going to, it's not going to work. But I, I'm, I'm very positive and optimistic that uh, this can happen and that it obviously needs to happen. Just to add, because I'm totally d'accord with what's been said, at the same time, you have to work 
collectivement, ça veut dire qu'il n'y a pas un, une catégorie euh, d'acteurs que vous avez cité qui a la solution. Il faut travailler sur différents types de solutions euh, qui couvrent euh, un champ euh, euh, important, à la fois technologique euh, et financier. La sphère publique a évidemment un rôle important et je crois qu'il y a eu une révolution qui est en cours, c'est-à-dire que avant c'était des sujets dont on parlait simplement entre ministres de l'environnement, dans des petits cénacles. Je crois qu'il y a une vraie conscience des banques centrales du risque systémique financier qui est lié euh, au risque environnemental et climatique. Il y a un rôle des ministres des Finances qui est très important et qui, je crois, maintenant, euh, il y a une vraie prise de conscience qu'ils ont une partie de la clé pour à la fois définir les incitations positives et négatives qui permettent de développer, développer les, les actions dans ce domaine, il y a un rôle évidemment du secteur privé qui est fondamental, parce que ce n'est pas avec des ressources publiques qu'on arrivera à répondre, euh, et de loin, euh, aux, aux défis. Et donc je crois que l'ensemble des réseaux qui ont été créés au cours des derniers mois, les banques centrales, des finances, mais également ce partenariat avec le secteur privé doit pouvoir permettre de, comme on dit, de, de, de put to scale les, les solutions qui, technologiquement, notamment en matière d'efficacité énergétique, existent. On, on, on parle toujours de, du, du, du saut en matière d'innovation technologique. Il y a toute une série de technologies qui, sont, qui ont un impact massif potentiellement du, du côté de, de, de la demande énergétique et qui, ont, euh, qui, qui, qui sont euh, une part évidemment centrale de l'équation climatique. Donc je, je crois que ces éléments sont très importants. J'en rajouterai un, un dernier et peut-être on pourra y revenir. C'est également euh, la demande de justice dans la distribution des pertes et des gains qui sont liés à l'ajustement euh, euh, qui est demandé. Parce qu'il y a évidemment, on parle également de redistribution de régions qui étaient très dépendantes d'énergie, quelquefois fossiles, vers euh, d'autres secteurs. Donc toute la question aussi du traitement des, cons euh, des, des conséquences en termes de distribution des revenus euh, euh, dans chacun des pays, y compris on, dans les pays européens, on voit en Pologne, euh, euh, c'était évidemment une tension qu'on a connue également euh, en Europe de l'Ouest, euh, avec les fermetures de mines. Euh, je crois qu'il y a également cette dimension de, de transition juste, euh, de traitement des aspects de distribution, euh, qui est évidemment un élément important si on veut convaincre l'opinion publique euh, que c'est un chemin soutenable. Monsieur Mestralet, vous êtes un homme du monde, so you're traveling around the world, and we see that actually sometimes the authorities are very uh, important in actually leading the way. I'm, I'm just wondering, we see many governments right now who are actually couldn't care less about climate warming, even though it's obvious um, you just crossed the Atlantic, south or north, um, and, and it's there. And um, north, at least, you could see part of the population's local authorities actually grasping um, this um, very topic and trying to actually make do and actually deliver and ignoring what um, the stance of the federal authorities. In, in, in the South, it's, it's a bit less obvious. And I'm just wondering, how can we talk about private and public partnership if actually some parts Some elements are actually have absolutely no concern for that. How do you convince them? Why haven't we been able, for instance, to convince the German authorities that that coal plant, that coal fire plant, should not open next year? So what can we do to foster that dialogue? Alors d'abord, pour, pour répondre à votre question générale, évidemment, la, la, la réponse, c'est tout le monde. Euh, c est, c est, nous sommes tous concernés, que ce soit les, les personnes, on voit que la, la jeunesse se sent concernée euh, et, et, et massivement et, et, et très fermement. Euh, bien entendu, les entreprises, le secteur financier, euh, enfin les pouvoirs publics ont évidemment dans ce domaine une responsabilité particulière parce que c'est à eux de fixer le, 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 le cadre général. Euh, pour l'instant, on peut dire à certains égards, ils ont commencé de le faire. Ils ont commencé de le faire et de le faire collectivement par, par l'accord de Paris. Mais on voit que ce n'est pas, pas suffisant. Je pense que les acteurs économiques euh, doivent être euh, encadrés par euh, des, des décisions euh, des pouvoirs publics qui les amènent à prendre naturellement euh, les bonnes décisions en matière de climat. Je m'explique. 
vous citez euh, effectivement le... L'entreprise en question, c'est une entreprise allemande, d'ailleurs euh, tout à fait euh, respectable, qui s'appelle Uniper, qui va mettre à Daten l'année prochaine en service cette centrale charbon. Vous êtes le, le CEO de, de, de cette entreprise, que je connais très bien, qui faisait partie de mon groupe Magritte, et qui était très engagé. Mais il est le patron d'une boîte. Euh, cette, euh, cette centrale a dû coûter un milliard et demi à deux milliards. Qu'est-ce qu'il fait il, a, il, a, il tire un trait dessus et euh, non, il faut le mettre en situation de le faire, mais de le faire pour des raisons économiques. Et la, la, la bonne méthode pour le faire, c'est le prix du carbone. Parce que si euh, il doit payer pour chaque, euh, chaque émission, chaque tonne de CO2 émise par ces centrales charbon, et il y en aura beaucoup, euh, à partir de, de 30 euros la tonne, ça deviendra une mauvaise décision que de la faire tourner. Voilà. Et donc, il faut le mettre dans une situation de pouvoir justifier vis-à-vis -vis de ses actionnaires, de son conseil d'administration, que la bonne décision, c'est de la fermer. Oui, mais alors, je reviens à ma question. Pourquoi est-ce qu'il n'est pas... En... On ne l'a pas mis encore en condition What is missing here so that... Alors, euh, le problème du prix du carbone, euh, là, non, je suis you, intéressant. You... Non, non, mais c'est... C'est euh, une vraie décision euh, euh, qui, qui relève des autorités l'espèce française et, et, et allemande. Euh, moi, j'avais milité euh, avec Pascal Canfin. On avait fait un rapport à la demande du président de la République sur le, le prix du carbone euh, et un, un, euh, on recommandait un, un corridor de prix du carbone en Europe. C'est-à-dire que le TS, qui est, un, qui est un marché, le marché du certificat, qui n'a pas donné, je dirais, beaucoup de, qui n'a pas euh, gagné beaucoup de crédibilité avec le temps, puisqu'il était à, à 20 euros il y a 10 ans, il est tombé à 2 euros avec la crise énergétique et la crise financière et la crise économique et la récession. Et il est resté à 5 euros pendant très longtemps. Alors, avec le, le groupe Magritte, nous avions proposé à la Commission européenne et aux différents chefs d'État une réforme pour éliminer tous les certificats excédentaires. Le prix est remonté à, à 25. Euh, donc aujourd'hui, il est 25 euros, ce qui est bien, ce qui est pas mal pas encore suffisant pour euh, faire le switch entre le, le charbon et le gaz, mais c'est déjà pas mal, multiplié par 5 en, en deux ans, pratiquement. Euh, mais qu'est-ce qui nous dit que le prix du, du, du carbone ne va pas retomber, comme s'il l'a fait une fois, euh, à 5 euros, voire à 2, à 2 euros une nouvelle fois Ce qui fait que pour les acteurs économiques, surtout dans ce secteur de l'énergie, qui encore une fois a une grande inertie, les investissements sont des investissements de long terme, la fameuse centrale charbon dont je vous parle, si elle est mise en service en 2020, normalement, elle a fonctionné 30 ans. Euh, donc jusqu'en 2050, on est une catastrophe. Euh, et le, le, le manager ne peut pas prendre la décision sur lui de faire un write-off de, euh, de 2 milliards, ou 1 milliard et demi à 2 milliards, si euh, euh, la poursuite de l'exploitation était rentable. Donc il faut la rendre non rentable. Donc euh, nous avions proposé un prix minimum du, du carbone en, en Europe, un prix minimum qui aurait dû être dans notre euh, les, les paramétrage que Pascal Canfin et moi avons trouvé. Tout le monde avait dit ils ne se mettront jamais d'accord entre eux, un écolo et un industriel de l'énergie. Si, on s'est mis d'accord. Prix minimum 20 à 30 euros tout de suite et 50 euros en 2030. Euh, comme le prix aujourd'hui, mais un prix minimum, euh, il n'y en a pas aujourd'hui. Donc personne ne sait si le prix du carbone ne va pas retomber en Europe. Euh, ce qui fait que personne ne prendra de décision à long terme en fonction d'une perspective s'il n'y si a pas un signal donné. Et le signal, ce serait ben, un prix minimum, mettons-le à 25. Alors, on est prix minimum à 25 entre la France et l'Allemagne. Aujourd'hui, peut-être 30 même, enfin 25. L'avantage, c'est que euh, les politiques ne prendront pas un gros risque puisque c'est déjà le prix actuel. Quand nous recommandions de le mettre à 20, euh, 20 euros quand le prix était à 5, était un, un, ça pouvait avoir des effets un peu destructeurs par, dans certains secteurs. Aujourd'hui, ça n'aurait pas d'effet à court terme. Par contre, par contre, ça mènerait très vite euh, les gestionnaires de la centrale allemande à la fermer. Voilà. So I've, I, with all due respect, I've heard this for so many years. Your passion is contagious. The challenge in implementing any form of a carbon tax first is implementing it, the second is managing, and the third is enforcement. So if you do the math and you implement it in G7, G20 countries, it's not going to have a big enough impact 
in the period of time that we have left, even if you take the most aggressive or the most conservative estimates of scientists. We are not going to be successful in ever putting in place a carbon tax outside of perhaps the G7 countries because you don't have the ability to marshal together the heads of state to sit in a room and agree that this is a fair tax. Again, we've tried so many different things. We have to change our dynamic of thinking because we keep going in the same circle like that hamster in the cage. We have to put on our problem solving hats. Something simple. When a problem can't be solved, no matter how many smart people look at it, you gotta stop and say, well, maybe we're looking at it the wrong way. An engineer is trained to design a piece of technology a certain way, but some of the greatest technologies in the world are not designed by engineers. I believe you have to go to the lowest common denominator. And again, I'm gonna go back to the central bankers. If you took the amount of capital that goes to Schedule A, B, or the top banks in the world every single day. Imagine a 0.25% rule, a quarter cent rule, that every check, every wire, every dollar that went to a bank that's controlled by the central bank under legislation of different countries, a quarter of a cent is taken right at the top. You get paid your wages, a quarter of a cent is taken. First of all, if that quarter of a cent times all the monies that go through the banks that already have in place a system to grab that money, if all that money went to EBRD and the Green Climate Funds and these other DFIs, because at the end of the day, everyone's pointing to them saying, where are you gonna come up with the trillions of dollars? And they're saying, we need private capital to do it. Let's just imagine for a second that we didn't, have, we didn't change our emissions. Our emissions continued exactly the way they were. That's the worst case scenario. It's gonna keep rising. So how do you offset it? You offset it by adding renewables and slowly reducing the amount of emissions. You get rid of plastic straws. You come in with paper straws. A quarter of a cent of every dollar taken to the bank, just like a merchant who has American Express. American Express subtracts two or three percent, Visa two or three percent. Would you imagine that that quarter of a cent for a hundred out of a hundred dollars, so for every hundred dollars, a quarter of one cent is grabbed by the bank, sent to a centralized fund, and used to fund renewables, used to fund innovative new technologies, used to fund ways to reduce emissions, used to fund mitigation measures. And that's managed by a global body where the central bankers sit and vote, and they have experts to determine where that money should be spent. Do the math. I've done it. You don't have to impose a tax. You don't have to manage it. You don't have to enforce it. You don't have to change people's lives in order for them to continue living in a world that we have enjoyed for so many years. Do the math. There is more than sufficient in a quarter of a cent per $100. It would not be missed. It allows CEOs of these companies to continue to conduct their business in a fiduciary way reduce their emissions in a way that they're comfortable, they don't lose jobs. We have to look at the problem differently. And I believe that there's enough intelligence here in this room. The central bankers is the key. And I can assure you, if you sat around the table and they did the math, they would come to the same conclusion. Quarter of a cent per hundred dollars. I go back to the fact that I believe there is a, a mix of uh, solutions needed and a mix of uh, actors that need to act. Because you will, this is a global topic obviously because CO2 doesn't stop at uh, country barriers. And so, uh, but on the same t at the same time, any topic on this planet, it's gonna be very hard to have an agreement from all nations, all people, because we, we live in different countries, we have different realities, we have different pressing issues. And so uh, that's why uh, uh, I believe that there's a, a mix of policy making and a mix of technological solutions that is necessary. I give you the example of solar and wind. Again, 
if you are in uh, in uh, northern England, solar is maybe not the best uh, best topic to start with. If you're in in Scotland, it's offshore wind, quite frankly, which is a great resource. However, if you're in Chile, then solar is going to be a very good solution. And in fact, you might have so much solar power that you can use it to uh, produce green hydrogen with it that you can then use for transportation or for industrial processes. So the starting point of each country is quite different. The needs, the emergency of some of the topics for each of the countries is going to be different. And so anything that we're going to suggest that says it's just that there's one single solution, quite frankly, I don't believe in it. And so I would say also in terms of um, policy making uh, that uh, you will have um, areas, the, car the carbon pricing is, is working already in certain areas, quite frankly, the 25 euros, we, uh, we could only hope, uh, you know, three years ago to get there. We, we, we were uh, at five euros at the time. So it's, it's a big driver already. When you look at even the United States, where the federal rhetoric is, of course, around coal and exiting the COP21 agreement, but even there, there's ITC-PTC, which is the wind and solar tax credit, which is a tremendous uh, upside for investors like we are to uh, create these two technologies at scale. So really, different topics are existing. Can we do more? to combine efforts, absolutely. That's why uh, some of these initiatives are so important to see what we can do on a, on a larger scale. Can we do more as companies even to work together? The Magritte Group was mentioned obviously on CO2. Do we need uh, a new association around green hydrogen to go faster to scale? There's, there's many things that we're gonna need to work on, but quite frankly, I, again, I can only reiterate, it's gonna have to be a mix of solutions because any solution you're gonna pick is gonna have advantages and disadvantages and it's not gonna work for everybody and that's why collectively we need to work on what works in, in our respective uh, area. By the way, financing was uh, were, uh, mentioned very briefly only. We are, Angie is the world's largest uh, issuer of green bonds with close to 10 billion. Right now, I'm not seeing much of a difference of pricing that I, I can get on this. I get access to more investors, that's very good, but the pricing is almost the same. I think in three or five years, I will start to see this difference because more of us, all of us in this room, are gonna look at how do we invest and we're gonna hopefully put more money into positive topics such as renewables and energy efficiency. And, uh, and, and that will be a big driver and is a great element to drive things forward also. We are talking about economic decisions. So obviously incentives are very important. Individual companies take also decision in a rational way, or at least we hope. Uh, so price signals are very important. National government, uh, together or individually, have obviously a very important responsibility to, to divide the right signals, sometimes by constraining behaviors, because it, it, it may be uh, uh, also necessary to more or less uh, accelerate changes of behavior. So I'm, I'm, I don't think we, we should put the, the, the stick completely out of the picture. It's one of the responsibility also of, uh, of the, the, the public actors, but also putting the right positive incentives to go to uh, the source of energies, uh, which are the most conducive to, 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 to find climate change. And I think we have, uh, good stories in that. Uh, and I think, for example, uh, the work we have been doing, uh, for example, with, in Africa, in the, with the Egyptian government, to work on, uh, on agreements which can be attractive for private investors to invest, for example, in solar or in wind, requires obviously change of legislation in these countries so that these uh, private in investors outside or inside the country can be attracted to investment there. Uh, this is one example, for example, this example of uh, financing Bemban, uh, an investment of more than uh, 1.5 billion euro, the largest solar plant in Africa, where more or less investors who didn't know Egypt 
discovered solar and Egypt in one go. And, uh, and I think this depends on putting also the right legislation on, on board. The, the last point I would add is obviously the pressure and the, the positive pressure of investors, obviously will most of us will be pensioners. <laughs> most of us have children who uh, want to put their money and their savings in funds which are meaningful for them and for, for their well-being. And I think we see also very positive uh, elements, pension funds being more and more uh, in, interested in putting energy in, in that field. And I think there also, we as international institutions with governments have a responsibility to define the right framework of what is green, what is not green, uh, what we call in technical terms taxonomy, which is more or less having in a harmonized uh, uh, definition of uh, these investable assets, because otherwise people will not have trust that they are putting money in, in the right place. Thank you. We have three questions from the audience. Um, actually, the first two, CO2 price increase is key to drive day-to-day -day decisions of all economic players to the right direction, how to quickly enforce a truly global CO2 price. That's the one that I asked earlier. You haven't answered, Gérard. Um, and um, we could link it with the, the second one, which taxes and regulations lead, led to public outcry and political procrastination. Why not nudge and reward small reductions in emissions? So, Gérard, can you please briefly answer the first one? Briefly. And, and Kerry, I would like you to, to, speak, to answer perhaps the second one. Alors, moi, je ne crois pas euh, à un prix global unique du CO2 demain. Aujourd'hui, euh, les, les techniques, que ce soit euh, euh, marché du, des certificats ou taxation, couvrent à peu près 20% des, des émissions euh, mondiales. Donc, un, ça n'est pas assez. Euh, deuxièmement, pour la, dans la plupart des cas, euh, sauf en Suède et euh, en Europe, malgré les progrès, le prix du carbone n'est pas suffisant encore pour obtenir une accélération, une accélération suffisante. Donc ce qu'il faut faire, c'est étendre d'abord le champ couvert euh, par le, le prix du carbone dans, dans le monde. Et c'est ce à quoi le, le Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition euh, s'emploie. Euh, des progrès très importants ont, ont été faits dans le, dans, dans le monde. Bien entendu, euh, en Amérique du Nord, si le Canada est presque exemplaire, en revanche... Euh, euh, les autorités fédérales américaines ont fait des, une marche arrière euh, mais ce qui est vrai euh, vous l'avez souligné, c'est qu'il y a au moins 10 états qui euh, eux avancent euh, la Californie a, a couplé d'ailleurs son marché du carbone avec celui du, du Québec donc c'est un, un seul et même marché par ailleurs, en Amérique latine euh, beaucoup de, de pays le Chili, le Mexique avancent très vite dans ce domaine euh, voilà donc il faut, la Chine a rejoint le, le, le camp et c'est très important. Le prix du carbone est encore assez faible, mais il va couvrir à partir de l'année prochaine la totalité du, euh, du secteur de l'énergie en, en, en Chine. Reste quelques, quelques, quelques blancs, euh, mais qui font des progrès. L'Afrique a fait des progrès. Et euh, le, le Moyen-Orient, j'ai pu organiser il y a un mois une conférence sur le prix du carbone au Moyen-Orient avec les Saoudiens. Donc euh, c'était assez inattendu, mais ils commencent à s'y intéresser. I believe that if you put the minds of the G20 countries together in a room, you could probably get all of them to agree to some carbon tax. I'm from Quebec. I, I see what they've done there. But I also understand this new concept of carbon tax evasion. Continue polluting, buy your credit somewhere else, and pass the additional cost on to the consumer, which ends up driving up prices and inflation. You know, economists, as you are, understand the impact of that. What, we have to set a red line. We have to say that if after 10, 15, I think it's 20 years talking about carbon price, we can't acknowledge that we're going to get more than 60 to 70 percent of the countries aboard. It's not going to work. It's going to be helpful. And I agree, you have to do small things. But if all the energy around trying to figure out what the price of carbon is, a tax, was put in one room and you couldn't figure it out, it's time to move on. 
and take those energies and put it to another potential solution. Nudging people with small incentives is not the answer. Because each day that passes, those incentives have to be larger. So whether it's a tax or a drain on the government's budget to give those incentives, it's the best way to grab the tax dollar, the best way to ensure that there's money for infrastructure in cities around the world is at source. And I ask you, take the time to look at a quarter of one cent for $100 taxed at the source, being at the bank that controls that money for every dollar goes in and out of that country. You add up that math, now you have money. More than you will ever get if you had 50% of the countries in the world paying a carbon tax on their emissions. I've done the math. So if you believe that you cannot get more than, if, let me rephrase it, if you don't believe you can get more than 50% of the polluters, of the G20 countries in the next 12 months to agree to a carbon tax that businesses will actually pay, we've got to look at a different solution. Because I think one thing we can all agree upon, not one solution is going to solve the problem at hand. But regurgitating the same old efforts haven't resulted in anything that gives me hope. And hope is not a strategy. We believe, I think as humans we believe, that survival is possible. We don't have to find another planet. We have one right here. It's crying for help. It's showing the symptoms of being ill. We just don't want to be a doctor. Guess what? We're all doctors. We're all architects of the future of humanity. It's in our hands. Let's draw a red line that if we cannot get carbon tax agreed to, let's move on and take the brains and intelligence and the passion to some better solution or solutions. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry for Monsieur Japio, but I'm going to ignore your question because if we start answering it, we, we, we will need so much time and you have to forgive me and you can meet me after, after the, the, that discussion. I, I would like actually to go to what is the latest question. Can we, what can we anticipate in the coming years? Should we stay optimist? And actually I had that question, that final question myself. That, are we going to see each other in three years time and what will it be? Are, are we going to be exactly here, you know, facing more protests? Are still seeing the carbon price not as high as it should be? Um, still wondering what um, the, Brazil the Brazilian authorities are going to do? Um, having the same person at the helm of the United States presenting that climate warming isn't, doesn't exist? What, you know, should we stay optimist? Kerry, you'll be the last to answer that one, because <laughs> Gérard. Moi, je suis un, un optimiste, euh, ou parfois un pessimiste actif, autrement dit, euh, euh, par, euh, je, 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 je crois aussi que l'homme est aussi rationnel, parfois. Euh, parfois. Euh, et donc, euh, le, la, la conscience, la conscience collective et individuelle des questions climatiques est quand même un mouvement assez rare et, et, et d'ampleur euh, exceptionnelle dans le, dans, dans le monde. Donc moi, je suis assez, euh, je suis assez optimiste. Et euh, si vous me demandez quelle, est, la, quelle solution je voudrais pousser en avant, eh bien, on va étendre la taxe carbone le plus possible. Et avec le produit de la taxe, parce qu'il faut la redistribuer, moi, je, je serais partisan de planter vos arbres. Voilà. <rire> So I think we have to stay optimist because that's the only way forward and because human nature, you know, is also, we're also a species that will find solutions. I, I, I am firmly convinced. I actually believe in three years when we're going to sit here, we're going to be a, at the same time astonished by everything that we've been able to achieve. At the same time, we're going to sit there and think uh, it's not enough yet, but we will not in three years have found all the solutions. I am, I am completely convinced. But we have to stay optimistic and keep working at it. And like you said, uh, there's many solutions technologically that exist. We've got to make sure that we move to scale, that we stop thinking that one solution is going to 
fit it all everywhere because it won't. And, uh, and even, you know, some of the things that we're obviously all working on, like electric vehicles and so on, have their own topics, own issues. So we have to find the mix of solutions and keep driving and, uh, and challenge ourselves every year. Are we moving fast enough and, and, and go faster? Uh, but uh, remaining optimistic is, uh, is key to this. And I believe we will find the solutions. I started by saying that I was optimist, so uh, so I, I will finish on that because I, I see also not only awareness but a lot of solutions developed by all people and all stakeholders we are working in. So uh, I think uh, who have, uh, would have imagined that renewable energy would develop in the, in the price of renewable energy w would drop so massively in the last two, two or three years. So I'm, I'm, I'm very confident. Okay. I'm optimistic because as you say in French, I'm pas de choix. But I will tell you something that when you're faced with a decision in life, there's three paths you can take. You can make the right decision, which we all have the ability to do, and we will be successful in meeting our objectives. You can make a bad decision, and you can realize it's bad and change it. But no decision will destroy us. We need to ensure we at least take some decisions now, not three, four, or five years from now. And I believe in humanity, and I believe the youth will ensure we have a future. And therefore, I. I'm optimistic the youth will force us to do what's right for the sake of our planet. Thank you very much. The Ordun, so let me really briefly sum, sum this discussion up. It was a very, very good discussion as usual. The urgency is such that we shouldn't talk actually about climate change. We should realize that climate has changed. This is what Kerry Adler just said. Well, beyond the point, we should agonize over what must be done and rather than dancing, as some did on the Titanic then, rather than procrastinate, we should implement measures as stringent as what was done, for instance, to ban plastic straws. For Judith Hartmann and Pierre Elbron, um, both believe that actually it's a partnership of goodwill that now needs to take place. It's not just authorities, it's not just you individuals, it's not just you companies, it's us all. There are solutions there, Finance, financing is being mobilized, and, and scale now, it's about scale that must be found. There are some technical solutions, as uh, Judith Hartmann pointed out. Wind was not an easy one 10 years ago, now it's ubiquitous, same for solar. And Gérard Mestralet came up with that um, solution of a higher carbon price that will make emitters think twice, if not more, think in terms of economical benefits or not when it comes to operate plans. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as a global carbon price right now, even though some big countries, such as China, have recently joined the effort. Um, but we're already talking about carbon tax evasion Kerry Adler points out. So we have to uh, mobilize more than just uh, these two, sol th these solutions. And for Jordi Tartman, you know, it's also um, a mix. It's not just one, it's not just carbon price being higher, it's not just technical solutions, it's just a mix of all. Um, Pierre Elbron so, uh, noted that incentives are also part of the equation. Uh, of course, we need to constraint. This is France here, so we talk about taxes. We need to be, you know, still be punishing people. <laughs> and companies, the stick can't be uh, put down, as Pierre said. But, but we need to send also positive signals. We, we need to encourage, um, like some projects are uh, led by the EBRD are currently um, doing in Africa. And let's not forget that investors are also human beings. So a coalition of authorities is uh, the way the central bankers um, can, in their own field, be, should also make a difference, uh, Kerry Adler noted. Um, and one has to believe, as Gérard Mestralet said, that we are sometimes rational beings. Um, we have to stay optimistic, as Judith said. Um, it's the only way forward. Um, in three years, she said, we will be astonished at what, what, what will have been accomplished, even though not everything will be solved by then. At the same time, Kiri Adler is here to remind us that hope is not a strategy. It's about doing. So may I suggest that you all grab one shovel and go and plant that tree. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>